Good evening and welcome to tonight's Zoning Board of Appeals hearing. Let me introduce some members of the town government that assist this board. To my left is Paul Hennings, attorney to the board. To his left, <coughs> excuse me, is Blaise Donatio, planner in the planning department. You are all here tonight seeking relief from the Smithtown zoning ordinances. And it's our job to try to help you achieve the relief you are requesting whenever possible. It's up to you to provide us with precise, accurate information so we as a board can make the decisions based on the facts that you present here tonight. We as a board must consider the five following conditions, and they are listed here for you. Whether an undesirable change will be produced in the character of the neighborhood or a detriment to nearby properties will be created by the granting of the variance. Number two, whether the benefits sought by the applicant can be achieved by some other means. Number three, whether the variance is substantial. Number four, whether the proposed variance will have an adverse effect or impact on the physical or environmental conditions in the neighborhood. And number five, whether the alleged difficulty was self-created. Procedures for tonight's meeting. Cases will be called in the order they are advertised. When you are called, please present your certificates of postings and mailings to Mr. Donatio. Then you will be asked to go to the podium where you'll state your name and address for the record and then proceed to tell us why you need the variance. At the end of your presentation, if anyone in the audience would like to speak on your case, they will be given one opportunity to do so. Then the applicant can go back to the podium to answer their concerns. Once the public hearing is closed, no further information will be accepted concerning the case. There are three ways to find out about your case. You can stay after the hearing, but there's no guarantee that your case will be acted on tonight. You can call the planning office tomorrow, or you can wait and be notified by mail. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The first case on the agenda is number 17848, Joseph Greco, 1 Hayloft Court, Smithtown, the location of the property, the northeast corner of Yellowtop Lane and Hayloft Court. The property is owned R10. The applicant is requesting variances to permit an accessory structure in the required front yard and to reduce the minimum front yard on Yellowtop Lane from 35 feet to 30 feet for an existing generator. Good evening. Good evening. Joseph Greco, 1 Hayloft Court, Smithtown. Um, I'm seeking a variance to reduce the frontage on the side property, it's a corner property, uh, from 35 feet to 30 feet for an existing generator, not a whole home generator that was installed um, after Hurricane Sandy by a licensed and insured electrician, but the permit was never obtained. All right, thank you. Anyone on the board have any questions on this application? No questions. Planning? No, thank you. Is there anyone in the audience like to be heard of this application? Can I have a motion to close this application, please? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next case on the agenda, number 17849, Conlon and Sons Properties, 175 Pulaski Road, Kings Park, the location of the property, the west side of Fifth Avenue, 281 feet south of Old Comac Road. The property is owned R10. The applicant is requesting a certificate of existing use to maintain a two-family dwelling in R10 zoning. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Vincent Tremarco. I represent the applicant. I've submitted the affidavit of posting and mailing uh, to Mr. Donatio. Uh, as, you as this board knows, this is a little different than an ordinary variance, and it's my job uh, to convince this board as best I can uh, with what available evidence we have 
that this particular uh, dwelling uh, was and is a one form, uh, one, uh, two family dwelling since prior to the time an ordinance made this uh, house and lot non-conforming. So we're gonna start off with uh, assessor's records and indicate to the board that the house was built in 1922. And that's as per the assessor's records. And I'm gonna submit as exhibit A1, A, A1 a, um, a copy of, well, I'm gonna hand all of them up in one shot and then go through them. This way the board uh, can look at them while I'm speaking. I'll give you two sets if it's okay. Okay, so the, the assessor's records will indicate that it was built in 1922. And how do we know that? Well, in 1947, when they first started to assess all of the properties in the town of Smithtown, uh, they hired uh, uh, a bunch of people to go around and check all of the houses in the town of Smithtown. So the notation on one of the um, uh, assessment sheets, and there's about five of them there, was that it was built 25 years ago. And you'll see it highlighted uh, in yellow. Um, moving along, uh, the property uh, was uh, purchased from Clifford Carlson uh, by Laura B. Stott. S-T-O-T-T -T, on 10-14-49. And that's in Exhibit A-1. Uh, again, the assessor's records. Uh, when Mr. Carlson sold it to start, the second floor was 80% complete. You'll see that in Exhibit A-2. Now. Okay. The... Um, The property in 71551, uh, well, it was first uh, sold to uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Hasbrook, but later on in 1955, it uh, was taken over solely by Mrs. Uh, Hasbrook. Um, when, when the original assessment was in 1947, the assessor did not go inside, and it's marked on the assessment records that um, uh, he, he wasn't uh, able uh, to check the inside of the house, and that you'll see in Exhibit A4. Now, I've given you copies of the balance of, of the um, uh, assess assessor's records so that you'll have a complete uh, view of what the assessor's records indicate from the beginning of assessment until the present. At the time the Hasbrooks owned it from 1951, uh, it is our contention it was a two-family, as will later be seen by an affidavit of Carl Veneziano and um, uh, another individual. I will read both of them uh, to you later on. We also checked the telephone records. And uh, believe it or not, uh, the telephone records uh, from the Library of Congress, uh, from a uh, telephone uh, museum, uh, I believe it's in Comac, uh, couldn't go back or didn't have the records uh, from uh, uh, the 40s and, and the 50s. So I guess I'm, I'm pleading a negative. Uh, we have no evidence one way or the other uh, with respect to um, phone um, uh, listings. We are also uh, submitting copies uh, of those 
just to show that we did the research, and I think, I think you have that as part of the record also. Yes, you do. Okay. So, the next thing I'd like to submit, if I can get it out of the paper clip here, and I believe you also, <coughs> also have copies of those, is an affidavit by Carl J. Veneziano and an affidavit uh, by Alice Hemblin. Uh, I'll read Mrs. Hemblin's affidavit first. Uh, she lives in uh, Sebring, Florida, and she was kind enough to give us this affidavit. In she states, in 1953 and 1954, I was friendly with the Hasbrook family who resided at 36 Fifth Avenue, that's the subject premises, and I frequently visited the home. To the best of my knowledge, I recall the staircase going up to a separate, a separate second story dwelling unit. And I'll submit that along with the next affidavit, uh, which is um, uh, given by Carl J. Veneziano. Uh, he's been known in Kings Park for many years as Butch Veneziano. Uh, he couldn't attend, he lives upstate now in uh, Morris, New York. And he states, in or about 1951, I was a young boy with a playmate uh, named Jay Hasbrook. I recall him telling me that his mother, uh, Crystal Hasbrook, purchased the house known as 36 Fifth Avenue. He told me that she purchased the house for the purpose of having rental income from the existing apartment that was upstairs. I visited the house several times, and there was an apartment upstairs. From 1965 to 1967, I was employed as a milkman, and I made milk deliveries to both the downstairs and upstairs residences. In or about 1967, I rented the second floor apartment at 36 Fifth Avenue, Kings Park, from the owner, uh, Anthony uh, Reganeksky. So I want to submit these two affidavits. I think you might have copies of them anyway in the packet. Thank you. Before I get into the uh, statutes uh, or ordinances at the time in the 50s and the 40s, uh, I'd like to call uh, as a witness uh, Carol Diamond, uh, who I believe is almost a lifelong resident of Kings Park, if the chairman would allow me. Certainly. Good evening. Could you state your name, spell your last name for the record, and give Carolyn me Carolyn Diamond, D-I-A-M-O-N-D. And your address, please? It is now 3 Phyllis Court in Kings Park. Okay, thank you. But I grew up on Fifth Avenue for 21 years. Uh, Ms. Diamond, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. And sure. Please answer them as best you can. How long have you lived in Kings Park? All my life. And uh, would it be fair to say, I don't know how to put this now, <laughs> are you over 70? You 73. Okay. okay. Um, now, did there come a time when you lived across the street from 36, 50? With my parents, yes. And how old were you when you first moved to uh, uh, 36? Or, uh, or across the street from 36? I was five years old. At five years old, uh, do you have any memory of? of uh, I was in the, the house. The yes, I was in the Hasbrook's house. Um, at that time, 
Mrs. Hasbrook lived upstairs and Jay and Barbara lived downstairs. Mrs. Hasbrook had gone through a divorce and over the years, Barbara married and stayed in the downstairs apartment. I babysat for her children and there was still the apartment upstairs. So it was always a two family home. And this is from your recollection from 1949 on? Yes, my brothers were friendly with Jay and Barbara. Anyone on the board? No, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now the next thing I'd like to address very uh, briefly is the, uh, I guess we call it a planning advisory report or a memo, um, which uh, Mr. Donatio was good enough to uh, send me today. And basically uh, what he says is that um, uh, all indications are that it was always a one family, at least according to the records of the, uh, of the town. Um, but you can see that uh, the first part of his memorandum says uh, prior to any zoning, it was a one and a half story dwelling, 900 square feet, and a detached garage of 180 uh, square feet. And he does attach a um, property card. As this board knows, the town of Smithtown keeps a record of every piece of property in the town, and they do it on a card. And that particular card shows everything that happens in the town, uh, either for permits or variances. Um, and the particular uh, thing that I think that the town or, or uh, Mr. Donatio was making reference to is the property card uh, that basically states um, that a variance uh, was gotten in, um, uh, let's see, in, in 2000. And um, if you look at the card as part of um, uh, the, uh, the uh, advisory report, uh, you'll see uh, that uh, a variance was gone for and it does say uh, an addition to a one family dwelling. Well, I'd like to indicate that that variance was gotten um, uh, for uh, the Conlon family by uh, Bob Conlon, uh, the son, and um, um, for whatever reason, and I'm going to have him testify, uh, he really never paid attention to these cards, and that's the record that I believe that the town uh, is relying on. More importantly, I would like to uh, address the ordinance at the time. The first ordinance in the town of Smithtown uh, was passed in 1932, and in 1932, to 1950, um, and it was a density zone. It's different than the zoning we have today. Today we have different classifications, R10, R15, R20, R21, excuse me, and R43, which goes by size of the lot. R10, for example, uh, is 10,000 square feet. R15 is 15,000 square feet. Um, but in those days, in the first ordinance that was ever passed, because prior to 32, you could have built the Empire State Building anywhere you wanted. It was really economic zoning because nobody would build the Empire State Building um, in Smithtown. However, you can notice that uh, you know prior to zoning, um, there were some um, things that you still can see today, like in San Remo, uh, there's the old Ferrara delicatessen. That was built before zoning. Today you couldn't build or, or maintain a deli um, uh, in that zoning district. I believe it was operable until, um, I don't know, six or seven or 10 years ago. But the point I'm making is in those days, it, 
Um, when the first zoning came out, it was density zoning. So in 1950 to about 19, well, from 1932 to 1950, um, the um, density zoning uh, for that area was, it was um, D residents and it was, I gotta get mine blazed. The one Blaze gave me, I don't see the. There you go. And uh, D residents, the density of population, um, no, that's C residents, I'm sorry. D residents was. You could have had. Eleven families to the acre. Eleven families to the acre. And that uh, was from uh, 1932 to 1955. Then, in 1955, uh, they changed it and they made it more restrictive. They only allowed eight families to the acre. Now, we don't see many um, multiple families that still exist but during this period of time, up to the 1955, uh, uh, it was permissible to have more than one family. Actually, uh, if you just look at C, uh, D, and C residents, you had multi. You were permitted to have multi-families on an acre of ground. The more restrictive was eight families to the acre. So if you look at the particular application tonight and the testimony uh, that was given um, and our research with respect to um, uh, the uh, assessor's records, uh, the affidavits that I've given you uh, from uh, uh, the two people who couldn't attend and of course Mrs. Uh, Diamond's uh, testimony, uh, you'll see that in 49 and 50, 51, 52, et cetera, it was permissible to have more than uh, one family at the subject property. You could have had, um, well, if it was eight families to the acre, you could have had four families on uh, the subject property. But we don't think there was four families. We know that there was two families there and it was from the very beginning, 1922. Very difficult to get anybody to come in from 1922. Uh, they would have to be almost 100 years old, so, and only my mother-in-law could do that, but she didn't live in San Remo, so. Uh, anyway, or in Kings Park. The final thing that I'd like to uh, clear up is, uh, I just wanna ask uh, Bob Conlon to come up and, uh, clarify uh, his uh, application for the zoning in uh, 2000. Good evening. Could you state your name and give the address for the record, please? Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Robert N. Conlon. I reside at 175 Pulaski Road in Kings Park. Thank you. At the time in 2000, uh, I applied for the variance and uh, for my mother who wanted to put an extension on the house. and. Uh, I applied for it, we got the variance, but I never saw the cards. I never saw the cards. I saw the cards the first time f uh, in May, six months ago, or June, when this all came to a head. If I had seen the cards, I would have hired an attorney, and I would have uh, addressed the issue. Okay. So given all of the testimony and the evidence submitted tonight, we ask the board for its favorable consideration and uh, granting uh, a certificate of existing use uh, based on not only the assessor's records, but more importantly, uh, the testimony in two affidavits and Mrs. Diamond's uh, testimony tonight. If the board has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Anyone in the board have any questions? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I do. I just, uh, I'm trying to establish the timeline. First, uh, Blaze, what's the date that we're looking to establish the certificate of existing use prior to? It would have to be prior to 1947. 1947. Okay, and, and looking at the exhibits you handed in, Mr. Tramarco, exhibit A1 shows a Laura V. Stott purchased it. So that's across the street. So that, I, get, I think you need the mic, uh, yeah. unless you can hear. Um, so, so 1949, your parents purchased the house across the street. Yes. And it looks like in 1955, the Hasbrooks purchased the house? No, the Hasbrooks lived across the street from my parents. I lived at that house until 1965 when I was married and then moved out. Okay, so Mr. Tremarco, it looks like exhibit A3 that you submitted, does that assessor's record indicate the date, the 36? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Exhibit A3, the assessor's record that you submitted, which shows uh, a receipt from the Hasbrooks for purchasing it on 11-7-1955, is that? Yes, but it went from Mr. and Mrs. Hasbrook, I believe in 1951, to Mrs. Hasbrook, um, what people tell me is they got divorced. Right. So Mrs. Uh, Hasbrook took over the house, but it was purchased in 51. Okay, so they own the house <laughs> the same time that your parents own the house across the yes. street. Yes. Okay. So, but your house was purchased in 49. My parents' home, yes. I, I was a child there. Okay, and, and you're saying 1947? Prior to, yes. Prior to, so do you have any evidence that shows it prior to 1947? No. No, she's not, he's not addressing it. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> he says, okay. Well, first of all, Mr. Tanzi, I don't have to show that it's uh, prior to 1947, because if you look at the ordinance, the ordinance from 1932 to 1950, Mm -hmm. allowed, I believe it was, eight or ten families to the acre. So it was permissible in 1950. It was even permissible in 1955. Okay, so why is planning say in 1947? Can I address that? Yeah. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Uh, I have a copy of the, the old ordinance that Mr. Tremarco was referring to. I made a copy for, for the board members and for Mr. Tremarco and myself. I had a conversation with my coworkers about this today, and after reviewing it and discussing it, we all came to the conclusion that what that portion of the code was saying was that you can't have 11 families living in one house. You can have 11 families per acre of land or one family on any part of one acre. So in other words, if you had an acre of land in, say, San Remo, and you wanted to have 11 families on that one acre, you could divide those, that uh, one acre up into 11 4,000 square foot lots and have one dwelling on each 4,000 square foot lot and that made up the acre of land. It wasn't that you could have multiple families on one lot of property, it's that you could have 11 families, the density is 11 families per acre. So um, I don't know if that helps or not. I, but if I look at 1950, I see under Article 7 in D Residence District, item number two says one and two family dwellings. I think in 1950, uh, that's actually when there was a difference between single family and multifamily zoning. And actually, sometime around 1955 or 57 is when they, they started designating the actual lot areas to homes or lots in R10, R15, R21, R43 zoning. So it wasn't families per acre anymore at that point. It was you had a plot of land in a specific zoning district that had to be a minimum of so many square feet, and you were allowed to have one family on that plot. Okay, so if we have testimony that puts the uh, use as to family at 1949 right now, and we have two codes in front of us. Here's the 1932 code, here's the 1950. We're talking 1949, it falls under the 1932 code, correct? 
Uh, from 1932, yes. So in the 1932 code, you have a de-residence district. That was a de-residence district, right? Yes. Under de-residence district, you have, in the back of that code, density of population. Mm -hmm. It does say 11 families to the acre. Right. But also has multiple family dwelling under item two. So multiple family dwellings are permitted or, or not, are not permitted? And I'm, mm, I don't want to explain this the wrong way. Probably multiple family dwellings were permitted, but it wasn't permitted based on one plot of land of, let's say, 10,000 square feet having multifamily on it. They, they tried to, in essence, um, figure out density-wise, land area-wise, how many families could occupy an acre of land. And they, they came up with 11, I don't know why. I guess if you took that 44,000 square feet and you made 11 4,000 square foot lots for each single family dwelling, if you had a, you know, a, an eight or a 12 or a 16,000 square foot lot, maybe there was the potential for having one multifamily dwelling, but it doesn't specifically say, you know, you need to have a minimum of one acre or 15,000 square feet or, so I can't really answer that and say definitively, yes, you could have a multifamily dwelling because I can't tell you what size lot you needed to have it on. But if we're supposed to interpret the code in favor of the applicant mm -hmm. and the 32 code, which is the governing code in 1949, says you're allowed up to 11 families to the acre and single family and multiple family dwellings are allowed and this site is on what is effectively a third of an acre right we could have up to four three and a half four families per acre and they had at in 1949 two families if you want to use the math that they used back then yeah probably because it would be four thousand square feet per dwelling unit times however many dwelling units you want to put on one lot so if the lot is 12,000 square feet, that would be three f dwelling units. Okay, so I guess, I'm, I guess to make the question as simple as possible, if they prove to this board that in 1949 there was a two-family use, the 1932 code is the governing code, and we just need to interpret that code. Uh, yes and no, because according to the assessor's records that I looked at, the house was designated as a single family dwelling. It, was a co it is a code 210. It's always been a code 210. A 210 code is a single family dwelling per the assessor's records. Okay. Per the building department records going all the way back until like prior to there was an ordinance requiring permits and COs, it's been designated as a single family dwelling. So it's not whether or not the 1932 code permits multifamily dwellings per se is was the house actually a multifamily dwelling, a two-family dwelling, or was it a single-family dwelling with an accessory dwelling on the second floor? Okay, so if, if the applicant can give us what we see as plausible evidence that it was used as a two-family. Perhaps. Dwelling. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'd just like to add that um, uh, when uh, Blaze indicates he had a conversation with the, all the people and in, in, I guess some of the people uh, that work in planning. Um, I think uh, the oldest person in, in planning, um, and I, I don't mean any disrespect, is Dave Flynn, and he would have been about two years old or one years old at the time. Uh, so it's all speculation on the planning department's uh, part as to how you divide up the property and it's really, well, if it's an acre, you got to do 4,000 for each one. That's not the plain meaning of the statute. And if this board is going to, and it has to interpret the statute as well as uh, what you said, M Mr. Tanzi, uh, what was it in 1949? Well, if you read the statute, it says, uh, eight families to the acre or 10 families to the acre. It doesn't say, well, you gotta cut them, cut them all up in individual parcels. It was density zoning. Density zoning is quite different than what we have today. So I, and besides, as you brought out, it permitted one family, two family, and multiple family. 
they weren't talking about multiple families or two families on separate lots. They couldn't have. Why would they even mention one fam uh, two families and multiple families? So I think it's more speculation on the uh, planning department's <laughs> part. Um, and um, we have uh, direct evidence by testimony of Mrs. Diamond that in 1949, there were two apartments, two, two units in that premises, plus two affidavits, one of Carl Veneziano, Butch Veneziano, who indicates basically the same thing, I believe, in 1951 and 53. Um, so uh, we asked the board to consider this and uh, uh, grant the application. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Planning, anything else you'd like to add? That's it. <coughs> Tony, anything? No. Thanks. Uh, is there anyone in the audience like to be heard on this application? No. Can I have a motion to close this application, please? So moved. Second. Moved and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carried. Thank you. The next case on the agenda, number 17850, Terrence and Nicole Heller, 7 8th Street, Wisconsin, the location of the property, the north side of 8th Street, 308 feet east of South Hillside Avenue. The property is owned R10. The applicant is requesting a special exception to permit temporary living quarters for a family member, a variance to reduce the minimum rear yard from 50 feet to 46 feet, for an existing 270 square foot deck. Increase the maximum permitted paved surface in the front yard from 25 to 39%. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Vincent Tremarco. I represent the applicant. I've submitted the affidavits of posting and mailing uh, to Mr. Donatio. Um, uh, very briefly, you have the planning advisory report. Uh, they recommend approval of this application. Uh, as you can see, um, we uh, conform. We're only 500 square feet uh, for the accessory apartment. The code permits uh, 600 square feet. Um, I believe we only have uh, one door. It, it doesn't have that restriction anymore anyway. And with respect to the driveway, um, it does uh, increase more than 25 percent. However, if you look at uh, the survey, it's really not uh, obtrusive the way uh, uh, the paving is done uh, to one side. And the deck application, uh, I think it's an incursion of four feet. It's certainly de minimis. So we ask the board for its favorable consideration. Thank you. Does anyone on the board have any questions on this application? Planning? No comments. Anyone in the audience like to be heard on this application? Can I have a motion to close this application, please? So moved. Second. Okay. Moved and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carried. Thank you. The next case is number 17851, Antonia Alvarado, 19 Lenore Place, Hop Hog, the location of the property, the southwest corner of Nicholas Lane and Lenore Place. The property is zoned R10. The applicant is requesting a variance to reduce the minimum side yard setback from 12 feet to 3 feet for an existing 126 square foot deck.
Good evening. Good evening. Hello. Can you state your name? Antonia and, Alvarado. And your address, please? Uh, 19 Lenore Place, Hapag. And would you like this gentleman to speak on your behalf? Yes. Fine. Thank you. Uh, could you state your name, spell your last name for the record, please, and give your address? Yes. Uh, Tim Jordan, uh, J-O-R-D-A-N, 9 Flamingo Drive, Smithtown, New York, 11787. Okay. Uh, uh, as, as you know, we're here today. Um, I'm um, here on behalf of uh, Antonia, and as well as John Doxey, who was the previous owner uh, from 1990 to 2017. Uh, it is Mr. Doxey's belief that the deck was legal when he purchased, purchased uh, back in 1990. Um, he later had me look into it, and uh, I informed him that uh, it did not have a permit. He didn't believe me, uh, and he got inspector, or I believe it is... Uh, uh, Lafour, who came out there and, and said, no, it does not have a permit. And he also uh, made some suggestions just for it to be able to pass today's code in general, uh, which were, uh, you know, when, when, the, when the deck was, uh, was built, the estimate is probably late 70s, early 80s at, at best. I mean, he was maintaining it. It was, it was rather old when he purchased it back in 1990. Um, Inspector LaFour uh, requested some additional footings and a beam put in. Uh, that work has been completed, uh, as well as other repairs, uh, which have also been completed uh, just for safety reasons. Um, there's uh, several other homes in, in the uh, immediate area that have a lot of side yard conditions similar to it. Uh, some of them, I've submitted some pictures, uh, some of them have almost the exact replica of the second story deck. Um, Antonia is the, the new owner of the house, and uh, there is money in escrow. Um, as far as the um, you know character of the neighborhood, like I submitted, there are uh, some additional um, decks and additions that are coming off and encroaching into side yards. Um, as far as the variance uh, creating a, a practical hardship, obviously they have you know a large. Uh, sliding door going out into that deck. Uh, it would basically, you know, go out to nowhere if there was no deck there. Um, as far as the, uh, the variance being substantial, uh, obviously I would, I would say the yes that, you know, to reduce to that size is, uh, seems more substantial than it is. Uh, it is cantilevered, so when you are underneath it, there's a, you have a lot more than three feet so if uh, any type of emergency personnel needed to actually get in there, they, they could. Uh, it's, it's more along the lines of six feet. Uh, from, yeah, and, and that's only uh, because the, uh, the footings posts are in the way at that point. But there's a lot of open space under there. And the, um, you know, the encroachment, obviously, is just coming you know, from, the second, from the second floor. All right. Thank you. Uh, anyone on the board have any questions on this application? No, thanks. No. Planning? No, thank you. No. Is there anyone in the audience like to be heard of this application? Can I have a motion to close this application, please? So move. Second. Move and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carried. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. The next case is 17852, Alyssa Rapisarda, 134 St. Nicholas Avenue, Smithtown. The location of the property, the west side of St. Nicholas Avenue, 113 feet south of Monroe Street. The property is owned R10. The applicant is requesting variances to reduce the minimum front yard from 40 to 36 feet for a proposed 141 square foot porch, reduce the minimum side yard from 12 feet to 11 feet, and total side yards from 28 feet to 24 feet for a proposed 1,320 square foot second floor addition. Good evening. Hello. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jason Rapisarda, R-A-P-I-S-A-R-D-A. I reside at 134 St. Nicholas Avenue in Smithtown. And you would like this gentleman to speak on your behalf? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay, 
Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman, members of the board. My name is Todd O'Connell, architect and doing business at 1200 Veterans Highway, Hopog, New York. Um, tell you a little bit about this particular property. Um, this property is developed with an existing one-story house, and the existing house that's in place currently is non-conforming in its side yards. Uh, we're proposing to build a second floor addition on this particular house and maintain the existing non-conforming issues. Um, on the minimum side yard, we're requesting 11 and uh, the um, require the 12. The property is skewed, so it's actually just a very small corner of the back of the residence that's in that encroachment uh, because of the angle that that property line is in. Um, that same condition is what ends up creating the aggregate um, as the opposing side does meet the minimum, but uh, that same foot that we lost on that back corner is creating an issue with the aggregate as well. Now, for aesthetic reasons, uh, as part of this whole design, uh, we're looking to put a porch on the front of the house. Um, porches, uh, traditionally, you know, they make the houses look nice, uh, they're a little more inviting, um, and we're trying to, you know, create some nice curb appeal and architecture to the house. And uh, attached to this porch, there's a small portico that extends out further. Um, and the porch itself at 140 square feet is not the entire porch that um, that projects into the front yard. It's actually only a, a about a 40 square foot portion of the porch um, that encroaches, or, or let's say the A-frame portico that's on the drawings that I've submitted. So we feel that, you know, with the request that we put before you, that it was a minor request. Um, obviously, the house is pre-existing, so if we're doing a vertical extension, we had no other choice. Um, you know, it's not going to have any, neg uh, any uh, negative environmental impacts. And in fact, uh, you know, we don't feel it's going to have an adverse effect in the area at all as we feel it's going to add character to the surrounding neighborhood with the proposal that we've put before you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone in the board have any questions on this application? No. 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 Planning? No, thank you. No. Anyone in the audience like to be heard on this application? Can I, can I have a motion to close this application, please? So moved. Second. Moved and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carried. Thank, thank you. you. Have a great night. The next case on the agenda, number 17853, Matthew Durkin, 8 Tony Drive, Kings Park, the location of the property, the west side of Tony Drive, 200 feet south of Tammy Court. The property is zoned R21. The applicant is requesting a variance to reduce the minimum front yard setback from 45 to 41 feet for a proposed 40 square foot portico. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Matt Durkin. I live at oh, D-U-R-C-A-N, and I live at 8 Tony Drive, Kings Park, New York. And I am uh, looking to, re I'm requesting a variance to reduce the minimum front yard setback from 45 feet to 41 feet for a proposed 40 square foot portico to keep people dry when they're ringing my doorbell. <laughs> okay. Anyone on the board have any uh, questions on this application? Nope. Okay. Atlantic? No, thank you. Anyone in the audience like to be heard of this application? Can I have a motion to close this application, please? So moved. Second. Moved and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you. The next case is number 17854, VEA 181st Realty Corp, North Fork Management. The location of the property is the south side of Main Street, 124 feet east of New York Avenue. The property is owned CB. The applicant is requesting a variance to modify a special exception to increase the number of accessory apartments from 56 to 62. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Vincent Tremarco. I represent the applicant. I've submitted the affidavits of posting and mailing um, to uh, Mr. Donatio. 
Um, I'd like to hand up um, a couple of, um, well, one is an article on uh, affordable housing, workforce housing, and uh, <coughs> the other is actual, is the actual Workforce Housing Act. And the reason why I've handed up the uh, Workforce Housing Act, as well as that article, um, is to first of all uh, compliment the planning department. Once in a while I, I do that, and especially <laughs> this time, uh, because this is probably the most confusing um, uh, act or law or legislation uh, that's come down the pike in quite a while. And you can see that it's confusing to both uh, Smithtown, but Islip, Babylon, uh, all of the towns uh, had some sort of uh, uh, trouble uh, with interpreting uh, the ordinance. But simply stated, um, if you have more than five units of either apartments or, or uh, homes in a subdivision, you must give 10% of that um, number of units for affordable workforce housing. Now when you do that, you get a bonus. The same law says if you have to give six, you get six more. And that's what uh, we're here tonight for. And um, the, the real question is, um, why are we coming to this board? Well, I guess we, uh, we're coming to the board because uh, it's under the accessory apartment um, um, ordinance in the town. But state law mandates uh, that since we are giving six units to, we're not giving, we must give uh, or allow six units of apartments to be workforce housing. And as the board knows or may not know, uh, they are, they, that's under very strict requirements of income and um, so forth. For example, in that article, which is a little dated, you can make up to 105,000 uh, per year for a family of four and you qualify for workforce housing. I think it's up to about 130,000 now. But the catch is, uh, if it's a home uh, and you want to sell it and you don't keep it for at least, I believe it's 10 years, there's a sliding scale about how much you can make on the house. They wouldn't want somebody to speculate with it. So, and the only reason why I bring this up is because now uh, uh, we're asking this board to give us what we're entitled to uh, under uh, the Workforce Housing Act. Additionally, uh, Smithtown Planning Department wrote a, a PAR, which basically says, yes, uh, we should get the uh, additional six units. Again, they call them bonus units, and we will be uh, constructing them within the confines of the buildings that were approved uh, by this board. In other words, we're not making them uh, larger. The footprint is going to stay the same. We've gotten uh, some two-unit, uh, two uh, two-bedroom apartments and made them into one-bedroom apartments. Um, the only thing that, that we find a little um, uh, concern, concerning is uh, paragraph, uh, second to the last paragraph, of the PAR on the second page, uh, where it says that uh, uh, the applicant has acquired the lot on the corner of Maine and Maple. Uh, that lot has not been made the subject of any application, but can provide design benefits. When we came before this board the last time, um, or the time before that, um, with this whole application, we indicated, yes, under a different entity, uh, 
we do own the corner parcel, and that would be made in the same design um, as the other buildings on the property. Uh, you'll notice that um, you gave us a variance a few months ago with respect to the musicology building. That's between the old lumberyard property and the corner property. Uh, and that's fine. We, we have no um, um, concern about making it the same design. However, uh, the balance of it, um, where it says it would be beneficial to create an overall site plan, um, that's something that um, we never applied for, nor do we want to do. That's a separate entity owned by a different company, and um, uh, we're so far along now with our site plans that it wouldn't even make sense uh, to include the, um, um, uh, the corner building. But I am saying for the record, and I said it uh, in the previous applications, it will be the same design, but we want to keep it a, uh, a separate entity. Uh, we've um, taken long enough to get this project off the ground, and this is the last little um, cons um, uh, application with respect to the, uh, the six more units. So we asked the board for its favorable consideration. Um, the uh, the uh, conditions uh, are fine. Um, and uh, the, uh, the second covenant, no more than 62 units, six of those units shall be set aside for workforce housing. And that's fine under the guidelines of Long Island Workforce. Um, and, um, um, that's it. That's, uh, we're at the end now, so we ask this board uh, to let us move forward uh, with this application. Thank you. Anyone on the board have any questions on this application? No. Um, no, I just, um, the only question I would have is the Workforce Housing Act allows for you to pay a fee in lieu of providing those units. You're That's maintaining that they're going to build those six units. They do allow you to pay a fee, yes. No, but my question to you is you're, you're testifying that you'll build those six units and not pay the fee. Yes, okay. absolutely. Thank you. Planning? No further comments. Anyone in the audience like to be heard on this application? Do I have a motion to close this application, please? So moved. Second. Moved and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carried. <coughs> The next case on the agenda, number 17855, Douglas Schroeder, 159 Northern Boulevard, St. James. The location of the property, the east side of Northern Boulevard, 396 feet north of Roseville Avenue. The property is zoned R21. The applicant is requesting variances to reduce the minimum side yard setback from 16 feet to 9 feet for an existing 447 square foot first floor addition and 360 square foot second floor addition and reduce the side yard from 16 feet to 15 feet for an existing 36 square foot balcony. Good evening. Good evening. My name is uh, Doug Schroeder. I reside at 159 Northern Boulevard, St. James. And would you like this gentleman to speak on your behalf? Uh, yes, I would. All right, thank you. Uh, good evening, sir. Ralph L. Sasser for Select Expediting. Uh, could you spell your last name for the record, please? E-L-S-A-S-S-E-R. Thank you. Uh, Select Expediting. Mr. we're here before the board tonight for a structure that uh, built at approximately the year 2000. Uh, it was obviously, it was a self-created situation. Uh, it was built without permits. 
Uh, the, the variance we don't feel is substantial, but I've submitted photos with addresses of properties such as 165 Northern Boulevard, Wexford Court, 182 Northern Boulevard, that have similar situations as far as the property lines go. There's not going to be an environmental impact in the area, and it does not cause an undesirable effect to the area, and it's rather beautiful structure. All right, thank you. Uh, anyone on the board have any questions on this application? No. Planning? No, thank you. <coughs> Is there anyone in the audience like to be heard of this application? Can I have a motion to close this application, please? So moved. Second. Moved and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, member of the board. The next case on the agenda is number 17856, John and Deborah, Deborah Slazinski, 3 Essex Place, Comac, the location of the property, the east side of Essex Place, 100 feet south of Genesee Drive. The property is zoned R10. The applicant is requesting a variance to reduce the minimum rear yard setback from 50 feet to 36 feet for an existing 420 square foot enclosed porch. Good evening. Good evening, Chairman and members of the board. Christina Fry, an attorney with offices at 7 Pine Ridge Drive, Smithtown, New York, representing homeowners John and Deborah Slosinski. On a rear addition, which is an enclosed patio, and as you see from the survey that I provided, it was documented in 1964. The home was built in approximately 1957. My homeowner has only owned the home for approximately 30 years. This structure has been in existence for at least 53 years, according to the survey. Um, this is a enclosed patio that would not present any undesirable change um, to the character of the neighborhood, nor any detriment to nearby properties, or even an adverse effect or impact on the physical or environmental conditions of the neighborhood, as it is something that is typically found on homes in the R10 district. Unfortunately, the benefit cannot be achieved by another feasible method as the R10 property only allows a 50-foot setback, and in this case, um, any addition to the rear of the property would require a variance. Um, therefore, I, I don't anticipate the area variance being as substantial as we are only requesting a 36-foot setback rather than the 50-foot that is a requirement. And the alleged difficulty was not self-created by my homeowner. My homeowner's been there for 30 years. And as I said, this structure has existed for at least 53 years. As you may have seen from the satellite view, there are other structures that are indicated on the satellite view. Um, those have been removed. There was a shed that is showing on the satellite view and also a pool. Um, there are no sheds or pool on the property any longer. Okay, fine. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone on the board have any questions on this application? No. no, no thanks. Planning? No, thank you. No. Is there anyone in the audience like to be heard on this application? Can I have a motion to close this application, please? So moved. Second. Moved and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you very much. Happy holidays. Same to you. The next case on the agenda, number 17857. Upsky Long Island Hotel, Radisson. Uh, 110 Vanderbilt Motor Parkway, Hopog, the location of the property, the north side of Motor Parkway, 1,020 feet east of Moreland Road. The property is zoned LI. The applicant is requesting variances to increase the maximum area of a ground sign from 32 square feet to 99 square feet. Increase the maximum height of a wall sign from 15 feet to 60 feet. Increase the number of ground signs from a maximum of one per parcel to three. Good evening, Good board evening. members. My name is Jeff Durham, D-U-R-H-A-M, and I work at 110 Motor Parkway in Hophog. And this gentleman will be speaking on my behalf. Good evening. So we are seeking Excuse me, uh, could you just state your name, oh, sorry. spell your uh, last name, and give uh, the address for the record, please? Yes, Alberto Gaitan, 
last name G A I T A N. <clears throat> so we're seeking a variance. Any address? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, 10 Prospect Street, Great Neck, New York. Prospect 11021. Okay. Okay. So the hotel is seeking a variance to replace existing signs on those. There are existing three directional signs. One is permitted, and the other two are for variance to comply with the code of one uh, directional sign per parcel. Also, a wall sign that's going to be installed to replace a sign that was there at 60 feet of grade to the bottom of the sign. And there is a ground sign that right now it's 32 square feet. They want to increase it to 90 for better visibility from the um, parkway. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the basic of it. Okay. Uh, would you like to add anything or? Okay. Does anyone on the board have any questions on this application? Well, no. planning. It's a lot of signs. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Does anyone in the audience? <coughs> excuse me. I apologize. Does anybody in the audience like to be heard on this application? Can I have a motion to close this application, please. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Have a good evening. Same to you. No. The next one will take three. Wait. The next case on the agenda is case number 1-17812, Elite Towers, 300 West Main Street, Smithtown. The location of the property is the south side of Main Street, 750 feet west of Edgewood Avenue. The property is owned NB. The applicant is requesting variances to increase the height of a structure, monopole, from 35 feet to 120 feet. Reduce the fall zone of a monopole from habitable structures or outdoor areas from 240 feet to zero. Reduce the fall zone of a monopole from property lines from 240 feet to 50 feet. A variance to the requirement that a PWSF must be located behind a principal building and allow it to be located in front of a principal building. Reduce the minimum required lot frontage from 150 feet to 62 feet. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Greg Alvarez from Amato Law Group, 666 Old Country Road, Garden City, New York, here on behalf of the applicant. Um, just to recap, we uh, were previously here before you on September 26. At that time, we had presented extensive testimony from our experts regarding all aspects of the application. Uh, there were a couple of open items from that meeting, so we were rescheduled to this evening uh, to address in the meantime those items. So they were as follows. Number one, um, we uh, were going to submit a planning report uh, which summarizes and confirms that um, the application will meet the area variance considerations outlined within town law. Uh, so we did submit that planning report from VHB that was submitted on November 28th. Also, there was a discussion during the September 26th hearing at which um, our radio frequency uh, experts explained the need for the height of the pole. And at that time, we did present uh, a, a several maps that demonstrated uh, the significant loss in coverage that would result even by a minimal reduction in the height of the pole. And to confirm that, we did submit affidavits uh, from both uh, the two carrier co-applicants, Verizon Wireless and AT&T, 
and we submitted those affidavits on November 28th. That was for the Verizon wireless affidavit. And then on December 6th, we submitted the AT&T RF affidavit. In those affidavits, they confirm the fact that the loss in service, even by a slight reduction in the poll, would be upwards of 50 percent, which would not per meet the coverage objectives in filling the need in this area. Uh, the final item we did submit ahead of the hearing, and the final item I think we need to address tonight uh, in order to move forward on the application, uh, we did submit revised drawings. Those drawings themselves uh, just updated some of the Verizon components. However, at the meeting on September 26, there was a discussion um, of whether to relocate the pole from the proposed location, which is sort of in the central portion of the property, in between the two buildings that are currently there, and shift it uh, slightly further to the east in the order of 80 or 90 feet or so. Um, that was on the recommendation of the planning department. Um, at that time, I think uh, we, we did suggest that uh, we would be amenable to either location. However, uh, we do want to note that, uh, in our opinion, we do believe that the location that is proposed currently uh, would be the most appropriate. Um, it um, uh, minimizes the fall zone relief to the eastern property line, which would be increased by the relocating the pole further east. And also, uh, in consultation with our um, uh, architectural firm that had drawn the that had done the drawings WFC um, on the in the area where the equipment uh, where the equipment compounds would be relocated under the planning uh, department's plan uh, it is located on a slight slope so there would be some uh, disturbance there that would be required to retain the um, the, the slope that begins on that portion of the property. So again, we believe that the current location of the equipment compound might be most appropriate because it is on a level surface and again, in the, two, in, in the middle of the two buildings that are already out there to provide maximum uh, screening uh, for the property and uh, the neighboring properties as well. So with that, um, we, we, we leave it open to the board. And again, if we could get direction, at least for that, we know that, the, that the, the record will just be closed this evening. But if we at least if we could get direction on the preferred location of the poll, that would help us as we proceed to the town board in their consideration of the tier three special accept, exception ap application. So we'd, we would appreciate that tonight. But otherwise, that, that's where we stand. And if there are any questions, uh, we are here to answer them. Uh, we do have experts here tonight on uh, the um, uh, who, uh, who had submitted the materials I just mentioned in the event there are any questions. Mm -hmm. right, thank, thank you. you. Board, have any questions? Uh, yeah, what, what's the benefit to moving the pole 80 feet to the east? Uh, I think two things. Number one, that we were moving it away from the buildings on the property. If there were ever to be an issue of falling ice or, you know, other types of debris, that it would be far enough away from either the storage building or the building with the offices where there wouldn't be any concern for injury or damage. Uh, the second thing is, is that the further east it was being moved, in theory, we believe that the visual impact will actually be reduced the further away from the center of the property that you move it. And what's to the east? Uh, right now, it's undeveloped land. But it is developable land? It is developable. I'm sure at some point in the future, someone will come in with an application uh, to do some type of development, but given the location that we propose to locate the pole in, there shouldn't be any impact to them with respect to being able to develop the property. So if they move it 80 feet to the east, what's the distance that it would be from the east property line? I believe 43 yeah. feet. Yeah, about 50 feet. Yeah. As opposed to? 143 feet. It, 140 from, and change, yeah. yeah. But what is it from the west property line right now? I would have to look at the plans. To well, I think that. we meet the fall zone requirement to the west. Yeah. Either way. Yeah. Either way. So, Either way. So central on the property keeps it less impacting on any neighboring parcel. Correct. Okay. Thank you. I have a question. On the slope, if it's on the slope, is that going to change the height? Well, it could. Uh, I don't think that we were aware that there were any slopes to the east. I think that's something we'd like to have an opportunity to take a look at and factor that into where we would recommend the pole being relocated to? Yeah, it, it's just a slight, it's a slight pitch. I can show you briefly on the plan here. Um, 
So it's the plan, it, this is the same site plan, uh, uh, sheet <coughs> TA1A, which is already uh, in the filing from December 6th. Uh, if you look uh, sort of towards the central part of the property, that's where the current location would be of the pole. And here are the existing two buildings uh, to the north and to the south of that proposed pole. Uh, the pole would be shifted uh, in this area over here. And as you can see, if uh, take a closer look at the plan, uh, the topographical lines are shown there where it does, it does actually slope up towards the north. Uh, the equipment area would be located on the, um, I guess it would be the eastern corner of the property. Uh, in the proposed uh, uh, planning department plan. And now, as you can see, it, it does slope up slightly right here. So uh, what would happen would be, there, we would just need to leave enough room for passage to allow the technician who comes on a four to six, six week basis to get into the equipment area and take a look. So there, there would be some disturbance right there. The other issue too is that this site has been subject to DEC review uh, because of its location near the uh, Nisquag River. <clears throat> So we already have uh, gone through an extensive process with them in terms of permitting that would be required, and I think we mentioned that last time. So um, it, we probably would have to go back to them if, if this word shifted, just so that they are aware of it and just to make sure that it doesn't affect our permitting with them. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the percentage of the slope is to the east? Um, I am looking in the direction of our architect to see if he can estimate that. Uh, maybe perhaps you can look at that briefly. <laughs> okay, okay. This is uh, Tom Marr from uh, uh, William F. Collins, um, the site architect. So he'll just take a brief look at the wider plans right. here. So they're located like right here. So it'd be this pitch right there. Yeah, in, in this, uh, from a visual, I can... Uh, can we have to uh, get your name and address name for the is, record, is please. My name is Tom Marr, spelled M-A-H-E-R, mm -hmm. represent WFC Architects uh, of 12-1 Technology Drive, Talk in New York. Thank you. Okay. Um, the, the slope is approximately about 30%, I could, I could say. Um, the topo lines, it's... I think they're about a foot apart. Uh, yeah, it, it's hard to say right here, to, to, to say an exact Excuse number from these, but distance to move uh, right. I'm not sure what you're saying. Okay. But they are marked on there. Yeah. So while it will be a minimal area that would be uh, impacted, there, there, there's a slope over there, so there just have to be a little additional work. I think it's safe for me to say on behalf of the planning department that we would not recommend having any slopes disturbed in order to have the pole placed in that location. Uh, I think that the prudent thing to do would probably be from that point to slide it back towards the west a little bit so that it's out of the sloped area but still not in, the, in front of or in the middle of the yeah, I think the issue was more the equipment compound location. That's really the area that might be in the, in the disturbed area. And can that be slid out of that area? I think it gets you closer to the property line, though, which we were trying to avoid. Hmm. It might require a very brief review for us to give you a definitive answer. I'm going to have to leave it open. No. Uh, what I could recommend is if the board does close the hearing this evening without giving you an, an absolute answer on this, um, I'm sure that they will discuss it at the close of the public hearing tonight. And uh, tomorrow morning I can discuss it with my coworkers and uh, probably have an answer for you later in the morning tomorrow. That would be fine. We just so that we can move forward, right? You know, to the next step. Right. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, is there anyone in the audience like to be heard in this application? Yes. There you go. My name is Diane Carroll, and I reside at 15 Lower Road in Smithtown, New York. 
Good evening. Good evening. Cell phones are now our primary means of communication. We're all aware of that. Improved service in this area is no longer a luxury, it's a necessity. We are faced with virtually a black hole in this area. Every one of us leaving Smithtown and going along Caleb Smith, heading towards um, Jericho to the west, and or Willits is faced with drop calls, no service, and inability to communicate. We no longer have the luxury where we can do that for any length of time, and Smithtown really desperately needs something along that transportation way. If I may, we've granted this board a tower at 495 Landing Avenue, which is the Country Club. And you had cited at that time, and it was this particular board, that the accidents along the waterway were important to address by putting a cell tower in that Country Club. What about along the Caleb Smith route? What about the park? We had an accident there many years ago where high school boys were killed and no one was able to call out for emergency service but for someone passing by. What about the gentleman who just a few years ago was lost in the park in Caleb Smith? He had no cell service. These are things that I think need to be addressed and we no longer have that luxury where we can say, we don't want a cell tower in our neighborhoods. We need this cell tower in our neighborhoods. We need to be able to communicate no matter where we are in the town of Smithtown. And to say, which is almost like a joke now, that it's the black hole is really unacceptable now. Um, I would ask the board to go ahead and approve the variances, especially in this particular area. It is an office building. They're the homes that may or may not be affected by it, are not in any kind of close proximity. It's an office complex. We desperately need some cell service over there. I'd ask the board to go ahead and approve. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else? So that's all I have for this evening. Um, if, uh, if that's all, uh, we respectfully request your approval as well on this application. Um, again, uh, we'd appreciate your direction. I um, think the, uh, um, the certainty will assist us in uh, moving forward uh, if, if, in fact, this board uh, were to approve it. But I think we have to go to the town board anyway, right, first. So, um, so we would just ask for your direction on that. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Right. May I have a motion to close this application, please? So moved. Second. Moved and second. All in favor? Aye. All right. Motion carried. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Thank you. Rick, do you need a break? Huh? All right. We're just going to take a five minute break. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We are going to skip over one application and do the following case. Number 17832, Debbie Barriotti, 35 Fifth Avenue, Kings Park, the location of the property, the east side of Fifth Avenue, 323 feet south of Old Comac Road. The property is owned R10. The applicant is requesting variances to reduce the minimum required side yard from 12 feet to 10 feet Increase the maximum permitted existing paved surface in the side yard from 25% to 40%. Permit an existing accessory structure in the required side yard. Increase the maximum permitted occupancy of the rear yard from 750 square feet to 938 square feet for existing multiple accessory structures. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, board. Michael Barriotti, 35 Fifth Avenue, Kings Park, New York. Okay. Um, I, um, I know that the dwelling that we're talking about, the garage, was reduced down to 600 square feet, which it is actually now. So I don't know where all these other uh, square footage measurements come from. I have a log shed and I have a doghouse. I don't know where this 900 square feet came from. But I am reduced, I am just going over a little bit on the garage, about maybe eight inches. Um, that's, uh, that's pretty much all I got. All right, um, where do we get the 900 square feet for the garage? That is the number that the building department calculated for the accessory structures in the rear yard. We don't necessarily know that it's correct. Is it all 
Yeah, I think they're including all the structures, oh. including the doghouse. So <laughs> yeah, and and the, and the woodshed and, and. Oh, okay, fine. All right, that explains it, right? Yeah. Pretty much. Okay. Pretty much. Uh, I mean, the tax assessor came out and she actually measured um, the cottage that's on the property that is legal in the garage and she didn't come up with that number either. So. All right. What's the height of the garage going to be? It's uh, according to code. So it's, like, it's less than 16. Less than 15, actually. Okay. I just see it. Thank you. Uh, anyone in the board have any other questions? Planning? Uh, I would just point out, I don't believe that the 938 square feet is correct. I mean, just a rough calculation, I'd say it's closer to like 800 square feet, 775 square feet in, in that area. Uh, and the garage is about 10 feet 11 inches off the side yard, so it's just about a foot difference in setback. But they reduced it to 10 feet, taking the conservative approach. All right. Is there anyone in the audience like to be heard on this application? Do you have a motion to close this case, please? So moved. Second. Moved and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carried. Thank you. Happy holidays. Same to you. Next case on the agenda, number 2-17636, Questus 417 North Country LLC, Starbucks. 417 North Country Road, St. James. The location of the property, the west side of North Country Road, 665 feet north of Edgewood Avenue. The property is split zoned CB and R21. The applicant is requesting <coughs> variances to reduce the minimum rear yard setback from 50 to 40 feet, reduce the minimum required truck loading spaces from one to zero, reduce the minimum required parking from 45 to 36 spaces, to permit a pickup window to face a residence district, to reduce the distance between curb cuts from 75 feet to 45 feet, reduce the minimum planting buffer adjacent to a residence district from 25 feet to 10 feet, increase the maximum number of ground signs from one to three, increase the maximum permitted square footage of all ground signs from 32 square feet to 60 feet, increase the maximum permitted number of wall signs from one to eight, increase the maximum permitted height of six wall signs from 15 to 18 feet, and permit six wall signs to not face a public street. Mr. Chairman, at this time, I would like to request to recuse myself. Fine. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Anthony Guardino. I'm a partner with the law firm of Farrell Fritz in Hopog, New York. I represent the applicant, uh, Questus 417 North Country LLC, which is the owner of the property in question, um, which is located in St. James at 417 North Country Road. Uh, the applicant is seeking uh, variance relief, as Mr. Donatio just mentioned, and that is in conjunction with its plan to redevelop the property with a 2,220 square foot Starbucks restaurant with a drive through I uh, have with me uh, to assist in the presentation, Dale Koch from Bowler Engineering. I also have Wayne Muller, from RMS Engineering, Wayne is a professional traffic engineer. And then finally, uh, Paul Pasilico, who is a principal of 417 North Country LLC, um, and Lindsay Tremarkey from Starbucks are both here in case the board has any questions. Uh, the property um, is about 30,500 square feet. It is located on the west side of North Country Road, uh, about 665 feet north of Edgewood Avenue in St. James. It is split zoned, as Mr. Donatio mentioned. Uh, part of it, uh, most of it, I should say, is in the CB zone. A small portion in the rear, which is on the west side of the property, is zoned R21. The property is currently developed 
with a 3,605 square foot one story masonry building with a drive through. Uh, that building was formerly occupied by uh, the Bank of Smithtown and later People's United Bank. Uh, the building, though, as you probably know, has been vacant for uh, a number of years now and is becoming an eyesore on what is an otherwise attractive uh, corridor uh, along Route 25A and North Country Road in St. James. We are seeking to construct this 2,220 square foot 42 seat Starbucks restaurant with the drive through. Uh, the layout of the uh, use will provide uh, 36 parking stalls, a dedicated drive through lane, as well as an overflow uh, and bypass lane that will allow up to 11 cars to stack in the queue for the drive through. Um, you will recall that we were here back in March of 2017. Time goes by very quickly. I didn't realize it was that long ago. Um, on March 21st, we were here, and at the time of the public hearing, the board considered the applicant's request for um, also for special permit and variance relief. Uh, at the time, the re application required a special permit for a counter service restaurant. So that was one form of relief that was needed. Uh, there were several variances from the special permit criteria that this application did not comply with, so we needed variance relief from the special permit criteria. And then we also needed several variances from the town's dimensional parking and sign regulations. As the application was originally submitted, it ne the application needed a total of 16 variances, 10 dimensional and special permit variances, and six sign permit, sign variances. Um, at the conclusion of the testimony and the hearing on the 21st of March of 2017, the hearing was closed and the board voted to reserve decision pending its secret determination, which I don't think has been made yet. No. Um, so th after that, um, and it was a, a co coincidentally that uh, the town was in the process of changing, unbeknownst to us, their code. And one of the changes dealt with the regulations for counter service restaurants and also with respect to drive throughs. So the town board subsequently adopted new regulations with respect to both of those, which of course impacted this application. Um, and they removed counter service restaurants from the list of special permits. So now we, don't, we were asking for a special permit when we first came here. We no longer need a special permit for a counter service restaurant. Um, and when we, when the board, town board eliminated the requirement for a special service, a uh, special a counter service restaurant uh, that had spe specific criteria associated with it, of course we didn't need to comply with the, the special criteria disappeared as well as the need for the counter service special exception. The regulations also amended the requirements for drive-in windows. Um, and of course, all of these changes favorably impacted our application by eliminating the special permit, the special permit criteria variances, and then a number of dimensional parking and sign variances, um, all of which formed the basis for a critical um, and somewhat negative planning advisory report that was issued last year in conjunction with that application. Um, and one of the reasons cited was that there was just, we were just asking for way too, too many variances. We have cut the number of variances in half. We need half the relief that we needed when we first came to you in March. And that was the basis for my request to this board to rehear it because I, obviously the board, I don't even think the board could decide the application on a law that no longer applies. So we wanted to come back, number one, to talk about the changes in the application with respect to the law, but also to share with the board changes that we had made to the application to the site plan to address some comments that were raised by this board and also to address comments that were um, shared with us by the planning department. So we had been working with planning to try to tweak this. And you know, there's only so many things you can do here. You have an existing building, but my client is actually gonna be reducing the size of the building at great cost because the building at its size generates a parking uh, number that is greater than we can provide. 
Um, so we are reducing the building. And also, we need to get some room on the site to create this bypass and secondary queuing, queuing lane. <clears throat> After the changes were made, the, um, I'm happy to report that today I received a, it's not really a planning advisory report, but it was a letter from the planning department. And um, that letter, which I'm sure you have, now recommends approval and condition of, conditional approval of all dimensional variances and many of the signed variances. Not, not recommending approval of everything, but, but most. Um, So a couple of things I want to point out. I'm going to ask Dale Koch to come up in a few minutes, though. Um, the changes that we made as a result of the planning meetings, and not all of them were subsequent to the March meeting, but from the very beginning when we started this process, um, we are reducing the size of the building about four, almost 40 percent, by almost 40 percent. It's almost 1,400 square feet. So we are uh, taking down a, a significant portion of the building at great cost. And it really is a shame because it's a beautiful building, but we have to do what we have to do. Um, the reduction in the building size also re resulted in a corresponding reduction in the amount of parking we need because the building is physically smaller. Um, the current plan requires 45 parking spaces and 36 stalls are proposed. So we, we need a 20% uh, a variance, which I would characterize as a reasonable parking variance. Uh, according to Starbucks, uh, they need about 20, a little over 20 spaces for a building of this size with the number of seats. So in their mind, we're way over parked. I know we're not over parked by town standards, but as Wayne Muller will explain, there's plenty of parking. There will be plenty of parking on the site. Um, the most important change, I think, um, was one that was, um, was made to address a comment that Mr. Tanzi made at the public hearing with respect to queuing. It was a question about whether or not the queuing that was originally proposed was going to be sufficient. So, um, again, there's only so many things we can do there with an existing building, chopped it back, kind of reconfigured the drive through lanes a little bit. Um, but what we came up with is um, a plan that allows for three cars queue in the, sec in the secondary lane, which is really the bypass lane. So if the amount of cars that queues exceeds eight, so eight's still pretty significant, but if it goes to the ninth car, the ninth, 10th, and 11th car could actually queue in the next lane over, and there will be a menu preview board in that lane as well, where the cars could come in go to the preview board, decide what the person wants to order, and then the two lanes would eventually merge before they get to the menu, to the ordering point, and then the person would place their order. And then the drive-through works in a conventional manner after that. <coughs> and again, bless you, bless you. The, um, again, that's not gonna be the, the, the we don't think that's gonna be a, a typical or common situation, but I know the town is concerned about the possibility of their of the queuing uh, lane or the number of cars queuing exceeding what the lane capacity is, so we're viewing this as sort of like a, a kind of a, a safety valve or a relief valve. Don't think it's ever going to be needed, but if it is, it's there, and that gets us up to to 11 cars. The proposal also relocated the trash enclosure cl closure to a more desirable location. Um, and again, that's from pl uh, planning staff's uh, view, and that created the ability to increase, uh, well, actually, that decreased the number of parking stalls by two, uh, because we were originally at 38, now we're down to 36. Um, so what do we need now? So as a result of the changes in the law and the plan modifications, we need, as I mentioned, six-dimensional variances, some of which are already existing, and some of which are already granted when the bank was, was uh, proposed. So we need a variance to reduce the minimum rear yard setback from 50 feet to 40 feet. 
but just keep in mind that 40 foot distance is to the drive in canopy. There's an existing canopy that was over the bank drive through. So that 40 foot distance is from the canopy, not from the building. The building actually complies with the 50 foot setback. The next variance is a reduction in the minimum required truck loading spaces from one to zero. Uh, we don't need truck loading spaces, so uh, that, was, uh, that hasn't changed. I don't believe the bank had a loading space either. Uh, so that, that's a, kind of an existing condition. Uh, reduction in the minimum required parking, as I mentioned, from 45 to 36, which again is, I believe, is a reasonable 20%. Uh, the variance is reasonable at 20%. Um, a, per, to, uh, a variance to permit a drive-through window to face a residence district. Again, that's an existing condition. There was a drive-through for the bank that already faced to the west, which is towards a residential district. The, um, the distance between the curb cuts from 75 feet to 45 and a half feet, again, the driveways were already existing for the bank, so that's an existing condition. So we're not changing that. A reduction in the minimum planting buffer adjacent to a residence district from 25 feet to 10 feet, that is for the area behind the trash enclosure. But I just want to point out, and I'll just go into it in a little more detail in a second, I just want the board to be aware, and I, I think you are, because I, I know I mentioned this last time. Because the, this, the property is split zoned, these distances that require variances are measured to an imaginary line. That's just, it's a line on a, on a map, but it's not physically there. Our property actually goes back another 40 feet. So while it looks like we need relief and it looks like it might be significant, the fact of the matter is when you get past that 10 foot distance, that is being pointed out, and it's not, I'm not saying we don't need the variance, we do need the variance. But practically speaking, it's not 10 feet, it's more like 50 feet. So it's a much greater distance um, behind the trash enclosure. And then with respect to signage, we need um, several variances. One is to increase the maximum number of ground signs from one to three, and that is for the original monument sign, which is already existing, that was used by the bank, we're gonna use the same pedestal there. And then also there are two menu preview boards, which will be, as I mentioned earlier, adjacent to the two drive-through lanes so that people can kind of formulate what they want to order before they actually get to the ordering point, which helps facilitate the, the speed at which they can process cars through the drive-through. Because if somebody stops and then has to make a decision when they get to the menu board, that's going to delay things. You want them to make the decision early on so when they get to the menu board, or the order board, I should say. They just place their order right away, and then they move on. Uh, we also uh, we need to increase the maximum permitted uh, square footage of all ground signs from 32 square feet, which is permitted. We're asking for 60 square feet. Um, the 36 square foot monument sign that's there was already existing pursuant to a variance granted by this board in, I think, 2010, and that's in the prior packet from the uh, the March 21st hearing, so that's part of this record. And then uh, we're asking, we were asking for a 12, foot, 12 square foot menu preview board for the uh, dedicated drive through lane, but now we're ad adding a 12 square foot second pre order board or preview board to that overflow. So in case we ever use it, we want people to be able to, to see the preview board. Wall signs, um, we are uh, seeking to increase the maximum number of permitted wall signs from one to eight, and those include the word mark, and the word mark is the, the Starbucks name, and then the, there are signs that indicate that this facility has a drive-through. They're located up in the corner of the, of the wall uh, on the facade, and they are both on the north and south sides. I do want to point out there are no signs facing west towards the residences. So the signs that we're proposing face north and south on old, uh, North Country Road and of course facing east towards old, uh, North Country Road. Uh, we are seeking to increase the maximum per permitted height of the wall signs from 15 feet to 17 feet 11 inches. Um, I do want to point out that in 2010 the bank received variances to actually uh, raise their wall signs to 17 feet. So we're asking for another 11 inches. So short distance uh, above what was previously granted. And then lastly, to permit six wall signs not facing a public street. Um, this building, as I mentioned, is visible 
on three sides from North Country Road. Um, and of course, the front door does not face Route 25A, so we have a sign over, we want to have a sign over the front door. We want a sign that faces 25A. And then, of course, Starbucks wants a sign facing north because, quite frankly, most of the traffic is going to be coming from the north. The morning traffic, commuter traffic, comes from the north heading south. And that sign is the sign that, they, that, that will identify the Starbucks to, uh, to people traveling on that road. Um, <clears throat> Three points I just want to point out in the planning advice in the planning memo. Um, I just want to talk about it for two seconds, and then I'm going to call Dale. Um, I, I want to point out that the planning staff memo. I think it 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 mischaracterizes one of the signs. One of the sign it's saying that we only are proposing two freestanding monument signs. And I think they're counting the existing monument sign, which of course is freestanding, the one menu board that we are adding to the overflow bypass, uh, the overflow queuing lane. But there's a sign at the northeast corner of the building, which they've identified as a wall sign. It's actually a freestanding sign. So the legal notice is in fact correct. We are asking from, to go from one to three, not one to two. So I just want to point that out. I don't know if you see the sign that's on the on the see drawing. That one. I'm missing the third one. Where's the well? The, <coughs> well, the third one is the existing sign that's right in the middle of the lawn. Got it. Right in the front. It's kind of faint there. It's because it's an existing sign. Mm -hmm. So those are the three. Um, we also uh, the second point I want to make is that we disagree with the recommendation to remove the Starbucks word mark sign on the north elevation and the drive-through arrows on both the north and south elevations. Um, the building does require identification, particularly, as I just mentioned, on the north elevation because it faces the direction of morning commuter traffic. Um, and then the drive-through arrows are very modest in size. You can see them in the elevations, I think, that are in exhibit, exhibit 9. You'll see the little black and white drive-through arrow there that identifies that this facility has a drive-through. Um, we think that that's important. Those signs are important because this site and this restaurant will work more efficiently if the traffic or the customer base uh, traffic is dispersed between the drive through and the walk in customers. So you don't want everybody using the drive through, you don't want everyone using the parking lot. You want people to be using both. So you want the public to, to know that there is a drive through here. And again, the signs are only eight square feet. They're very modest in size. Um, I also want to point out, before I forget, that when we were working with planning, we were encouraged to look at the signage over at the Nest Consit uh, uh, Starbucks that's on Smithtown Boulevard. And there, that's a facility that's on an end cap on the western side, western side of the building. But they have the word mark, but they, it's not, it only, not only says Starbucks, but it says Starbucks and coffee, and it has a drive-through. All the three things are on there. We've tried to emulate that. We, of course, have one extra wall because we're freestanding building, so we want to put the sign on the north side as well. But I would point out that the signage that we are proposing is not only similar to what's in this concept, it's actually less in size because the wall signs don't have the word coffee, which makes this, the word mark probably double the size uh, that we're proposing. Um, the last item is that, you know, we will, you know, listen, I, I, don't, I don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth. We are very pleased that we did get a fa more favorable memo from planning. Um, but there was a request to relocate the trash enclosure, which we will gladly do. But I don't, I don't see the need to do it, and I, I just, I don't think there's any justification. But if, if the board wants us to do it, we'll do it. Um, as I mentioned, the enclosure is set back 10 feet from the residential zone, but that's the imaginary line. We are actually a greater distance away. So by moving the, the trash enclosure further south, the parking lot does not work as well, and I don't think you gain anything by doing it because we are so far away. On paper, it looks like it's a significant change because it's, you're measuring to the imaginary line, the zone line, but in 
when you when you look at the site, you're you're much further away from the residential properties than 10 feet. So I just point that out because if you want us to move it, we'll move it. Um, and then the last point was that the um, the houses that are closest to the trash enclosure are on these very long, narrow lots that I highlighted at the last hearing um, that are face fi a 50 acre road. And th these two photographs are actually in the book from the last time, so you have it in the record. The two houses that border the, the back of the proposed Starbucks, uh, one, the house is located 374 feet from the building. And um, that is measured to the closest point, which is the canopy. So it's even further from the building. And then the other one that's just south of that, which is this one here, when you measure to the trash enclosure, this trash enclosure is probably going to be here, that would measure two, roughly 250 feet. So they are a great, great distance from the trash enclosure. So to me, moving it to increase that by four feet doesn't seem to make sense, but we'll do it. I just want to point that out. All right, I, let me just uh, introduce Dale Koch. Dale, if you could just, you know, just describe some of the changes that we have made, or, you know, based on the planning's comments, that would be great. Thanks. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Dale Koch with the firm Bowler Engineering, 2929 Expressway Drive North, Hophog, New York. So I think Mr. Guardino did a really good job explaining the changes that we made to the site plan. I'll just re uh, reiterate a few of the changes that we made working with planning. Um, most importantly, that pre... Oh, hold on one second. So that pre-read board was added in the striped island in the drive through lane, which was originally a bypass lane. Um, it's our opinion that this will really function still as a bypass lane. Once the queue, if, if during a peak hour the queue was to get up to eight cars, which your eight, eighth car would be right at the North Country Road entrance, we do have some overflow to allow to get the stacking up to 11 cars and people will still read some type of menu, menu board to decide what they want to order once they get to the menu board itself. Um, we cut the building back a little bit more on the north elevation, reducing the size of the building down to 2,200 square feet just giving a little bit more room for the drive through to function. Um, the lanes are now 12 feet and 11 and a half feet respectively from the, bottom, from the north elevation of the, the store to the north property line. Um, this buffer actually increased, it's now three feet. Um, nothing significant, but we are able to put some bushes and plantings in that area now. Oh, I'm sorry, it's six feet. This, this northern buffer line is six feet. Um, working our way around, um, this, this landscaped area still essentially stayed the same, but it is um, providing an area for two land bank stalls if we ever needed them, which all the setbacks and everything that we described in the previous hearing are still the same. It's 15 and a half feet if we were to build out those two land bank stalls. We also um, eliminated two parking stalls on the southeast corner of the building. Those are now land banked as well. Um, we felt that while working with planning that if we were able to make those land banking, if they were ever absolutely necessary, we could build them out. But I mean, they're not the uh, most ideal location for parking stalls. So increasing the landscaping along North Country Road, we felt would be a better option at this point based on the traffic study we did and the parking counts we were finding that we would need for this size store. The trash enclosure and parking stalls to the west were shifted to the east a little bit, providing that 10-foot setback to the residential zone line, and then providing 49.8 feet to the actual property line to the west, and then 30.8 feet to this northern property line from the trash enclosure. And we're also providing 14 and a half feet from this corner of the parking stall to the um, residential zone line and then just finally shifted some of the parking around. I mean, it's, it's not a significant change, but by, channelized, by channelizing these two lanes, we were able to add a little bit more of a concrete, um, concrete end island with some landscaping to protect the cars 
that are parking in this row of parking and then still maintain these couple of stalls in front of the building for your handicap accessible stalls and an additional stall. Um, that's really it for the site plan and I'll just show you some exhibits for the signage. As Mr. Guardino mentioned, I mean I think if you look at the elevations, they're really pretty modest. The signage is your Starbucks channel letter set. Um, there are no more disc logos. The sign themselves are 17 square feet. If you added up all the wall signs, it's less than what would be permitted on one side of the wall. So if we wanted to design one sign, it's allowed to go up to 114 square feet, uh, 114 square feet per the code. So at this point, you have the 17 square foot Starbucks channel letter set, and then your drive-through sign is four and a half square feet. I mean, it's, again, not a very big sign, but really helps with motorists to distinguish where the drive-through is and what driveway to use. And as part of the application, we did eliminate these two, there were two drive-through entrance signs. There were freestanding signs that were about five square feet on the ground. Those have been eliminated, so we feel like it's pretty important to have some type of sign on the building just to help direct the traffic into the drive-through, because if they were to pull into the parking lot, the only way to get back to the drive-through would be circulating back out into North Country Road and into the drive-through. So um, again, it's nothing significant. Their channel letters set signs, they're gonna be illuminated. I mean, I think they're pretty tasteful. Um, you know, I, ultimately, it's really, I think, works well for the building. And like we said, it's really important for the motorists and the customers using that drive-through to know which driveway to use as they're traveling down North Country Road. two elevations. So the west elevation, there's no signage. And then on your, um, I believe this is the south elevation facing the parking lot, once again is that Starbucks sign. Oh, one second. Gotcha. Uh, we have to change the tape. Okay. Anthony.